I've got something really unique for you today. Not because it's a tube amp, not because it's a headphone amp and preamp, not because it's even a hybrid tube amp, but because it's one of the most versatile and variable and tube rolling friendly amps I've ever come across. And it's the Sparkos Labs Gemini that I'm talking about here. This is a hybrid tube amp, meaning that it's a combination of a solid state amp and a tube amp kind of meshed together. But what really sets it apart is the number of different tubes you can roll through it and also the ways that you can tweak its sound with various internal settings if you want to play with them. And so don't get put off. If you're somebody that's not interested in tweaking and adjusting the sound and you just want a good sounding tube amp, I'm going to talk about it in that context as well. So this is an amp that you can just buy, put on a shelf or a desk and just enjoy listening to it. Or if you're somebody that really wants to play with tubes, you can go to any level of tweakability that you might want to and really see what this is capable of. Before we jump into the review, I want to say a huge thanks to Andrew from Sparkos Labs for sending me across a Gemini to have a good play with. And because this is such a unique amplifier, I've actually organized an interview with Andrew. And so if you've got any questions that you'd like me to ask Andrew after you've heard me talk about the Gemini, or maybe you've got questions about their range of op amps or the Aries headphone amp, anything you like from the Sparkos world, then do let me know down in the comments the questions that you would like me to ask Andrew and I'll be sure to go through them and integrate as many of them as I can into the interview with him. Now that interview will either come out here on the channel and or on the Passion for Sound podcast and I'll be sure to let you know when that's released. If it's released only as a podcast, I will put posts here on YouTube so you'll know all about it. For now though, let's jump in and talk about the Gemini but do let me know down in the comments if there's anything you want me to dig deeper about. <laughs> Gemini amp here comes in at $995 US dollars, making it a much cheaper amp than Sparko's other offering in the Aries, which is a very high-end, solid-state only headphone amp and preamp. It's a wonderful device. I've reviewed it here on the channel before. But the fact that this costs a lot less than the Aries doesn't mean that you're getting any less attention to detail from Andrew and the team at Sparko's. What's going on inside the Gemini here is you've got a tube gain stage, meaning that the signal's going to come into the amplifier, it's going to be initially kind of amplified by the tube, and then it's going to go to an output stage that's made with a pair of Sparko's own pro-grade op-amps, that being the SS2590 chips. And so you've got some really top class processing of the sound going on in here. And when I say processing, it is all still analog. There's no DSP or anything being done. But the point is it's going through high quality circuitry, even though the price tag is much lower than the Aries. What else is happening inside these circuits is we've got no feedback being used. And that means that this probably isn't going to measure as well as some of the super duper clean 0. 0.0000 something percent amplifiers. But instead, what you're getting in theory and based on my experience is by having zero feedback, you should be getting a very pure sound, a sound that isn't getting overly artificial due to lots and lots of feedback to strip out distortion that somehow often also strips out the soul and the heart of the music. To take that a step further, Andrew has also designed this to have no capacitors in the signal path. Often with tube amps, they put capacitors into the circuit to protect the headphones or the speakers from any unwanted discharges from the tube if the tube fails, for instance but there's other ways around that, and that's what Andrew's used here. And so there's no capacitor in the output circuit, which means again, we should be getting as transparent and pure a sound as possible. As for the hybrid design being a combination of the tube and the solid state output stage, one of the benefits of that is we get a very low output impedance. So if you've dabbled at all into tube amps, what you might know is that some tube amps have very high output impedance, 
And what that means is that they don't necessarily play well with all different sorts of headphones. Putting a lower impedance headphone with a higher output impedance amplifier can result in a significant loss of power and or it can alter the frequency response of the headphones. But there's no such trouble here because the output stage using those Pro Sparkos op amps, that's going to take care of that and keep the output impedance below 0.25 ohms. So that's fantastic as well. Finally, you might be wondering about the power output of this one, and it's going to give you 2 watts into a 32 ohm load, or about 750 milliwatts into a 300 ohm load. So it's not a crazy powerful amplifier, but it's got plenty to drive most normal headphones. As per usual on this sort of device, we're not talking about driving Sasvaras, Abyss 1266, etc. from this, but you will drive pretty much anything else quite happily. And if you're worried that the 300 ohm figure was only at 750 milliwatts, that's actually buckets of power for any 300 ohm headphone I've ever come across. And to put that into perspective, something like an HD 660S2 from Sennheiser requires just 13 milliwatts to get to 110 dB, which is an unsafe level of listening. It does mean that you're going to have enough kind of extra power for peaks and transit in the music. But the point is that your constant output power required is well below 13 milliwatts for an HD 660S2. If we look at some slightly more difficult high impedance headphones, like some of the ZMFs, even those only get up to needing about 25 milliwatts to hit those 110 dB peaks. So having 750 milliwatts on tap means you've got buckets of headroom, no issues at all. This is going to be purring along quite happily with pretty much any high impedance headphone that I've ever come across. And so with all those specs and details out of the way, let me give you a quick device tour before we dive deeper into things like how this sounds and what all the adjustments are that I spoke about before. Looking at the front of the unit first, over on the side here we've got a power button, that's just a simple toggle switch. As we then move on you've got a blue LED light letting you know when it's on and off. And one thing that does happen when you switch this on is it does have an automatic, I think it's a 40 second delay from memory. But either way, it's got an automatic delay that's going to prevent any sound coming out until the tube's fully warmed up. Moving further across, we've got a 4-pin XLR output and a 6.3mm output. And it is worth noting, this is not a balanced headphone amplifier. The 4-pin XLR is just there for convenience, and I like the fact that it's there. I was chatting to channel patrons on a recent Q&A call, and one of the things we spoke about was that I really like the fact that when you get an amplifier like this, having the 4-pin XLR means you don't have to worry about using any sort of adapter for your balanced headphone cables. You can just plug it straight in here, or you can plug in another headphone that's 6.3mm only into this socket. The other thing I really like about it is that it means you don't have to worry about which one you plug into. Both of these are going to sound exactly the same because it's exactly the same connection. There's no different circuitry sitting behind them, they're just different connectors. And what that then means for us is that if you've got one headphone that's 6.3mm wired, you don't have to worry that you're getting lesser sound quality out of the Gemini. It's giving you equal sound quality through either connection, and I do like that. Moving further across the front panel, we've then got a toggle switch for the gain, so you've got high gain and low gain, and we'll come back around to that one soon because that's a big part of also tweaking the sound quality of the Gemini. Not in the sense that it works better in high gain or low gain, but because of the way the circuit works, this changes how much of the tube influence gets into the sound, and you can have a lot of fun with this and one of the internal settings to really get a sense of which sound you like from each tube. As I said, we'll get into that soon. Don't be put off. If you don't want to play with those things, you don't have to. It's just one of those things that's there should you want it. Finally, over on the end here, we've got our volume knob. And I've got mixed feelings about this. The first thing to say is that it's a wonderful volume pot sitting on the inside. It's a very smooth turning motion. It feels like a nice, high quality knob that Andrew's put onto here. The thing that I'm not such a fan of is I do like a slightly larger and chunkier volume knob. I get why they've used the size they have to keep the overall size of the amplifier down, and that's a big benefit of this amplifier is it is compact if it's going on your desk. But on the other hand, I would have liked a slightly kind of chunkier, nicer feeling control knob on there. It's a minor thing. What matters most is the internal volume pot is a really high quality Alps Blue Velvet pot, and that's going to result in excellent sound quality and excellent channel matching right the way down to almost the very, very bottom. As we flick around now to the back of the amplifier, what we've got on the back is a mains power input, so the Gemini has got an internal linear power supply as you'll see in a moment. And then as we move across we've got very simple controls here, we've got RCA inputs and RCA outputs and that's that. Now as I think about it I haven't actually tested the outputs of this one, and that's because there is so much else to think about that I've really focused on this purely as a headphone amp only, 
these are a preamp output, but what I haven't looked into is if they use both sections of the output stage and the gain stage, if they use both the tube and the solid state, or only one part, I haven't looked into that, so I apologize for that. If that's a specific question for you, let me know in the comments down below, and I'll look into that further and reply in the comments. And so as you can see, the back panel here is very simple, and the only other thing to point out is that we've then got our tube sticking through the top of the amplifier there. And so everything's very simple. The build quality I would describe as very solid. It feels like a sturdy, well put together amplifier, but there's nothing kind of flashy or fancy or particularly refined about it. It's a very simple stamped metal cover that goes on here. And then you've got the same sort of stamped or folded metal base. So it's not particularly, as I said, refined or fancy, but it feels high quality, solid. As I said before, it's very compact and simple on the desk. And so some are gonna like it, some aren't gonna like it so much. I think it's just fine. I'm neither here nor there on the design and that's completely okay. What I care about most is how it sounds. And before we get to the actual sound quality, I need to explain a bit about the Gemini and all the different settings and options and tweakability that it has. Before I get there though, I just wanna remind you, if you're enjoying this content, if you wanna see more of this sort of content, then please hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and ring the notification bell. It makes a huge difference to the channel, it helps me continue to grow the channel, and make new and different content, and I really appreciate it. So thanks very much, and now let's talk about the tweakability here. As I mentioned before, we've got the gain switch on the front, and that's going to actually adjust also how much of the tube influence you get, so it's going to make the signal louder earlier on the volume control, but in doing so, it's also going to allow more or less of the tube influence in. So in low gain, you're gonna get more of the tube influence. In high gain, you're gonna get less of the tube influence. And I'm assuming that's because in high gain, it must be using more of the power of the output stage. And therefore you're getting more or less of the tube's influence depending on how much of that output stage power you're using. As an example of that with the stock 6922 tube that's in there, what you get when you go into low gain mode is a slightly smoother overall sound. So you get a slightly smoother top end, the treble gets a bit smoother, not exactly rolled off, but just a little bit smoother. But then the other thing you're trading off is that you lose a little bit of tightness and control in the bass. It's not to say that either sound is better or worse, they're just different. And that's a part of the charm for me at least at the Gemini, is depending on the tube you put in there, you can quickly and easily see if you want a little bit more or a little bit less of its sound just with the gain switch. And then if you want to take things further, and as I said before, you don't have to do these things, so don't be overwhelmed or intimidated by this. But if you want to go further, you can very simply remove six screws around the side and lift off the cover of the Gemini. And by the way, this is designed for this to be done this way. It's set up in a way that you can't really do anything wrong as long as you follow the instructions. You'd have to kind of deliberately do the wrong thing to cause any problems in here. And so then once you lift off this cover, you get three more settings to play with. Now, one of them to cover off quickly is just to allow for different sorts of tubes to work. So over on the side here between the tube and the capacitors, there's a jumper switch here that you can move between two different sets of pins. And what that's going to do is change the heat of voltage. Now, if you've ever played with tube amps or seen tube amps, you'll know they need to get hot to work. And that's because there's heat required inside the tube to start releasing the electrons and that's what allows the tube to actually create the sound is those free electrons floating around in there that allow you to amplify the sound as the signal passes through. It's a very very dumbed down version but the key is the tube needs to be hot and some tubes need one voltage for the heater, other tubes need a different voltage, that's all that one's doing. And so by having that jumper switch there it opens the ability for the Gemini to work with lots of different tube varieties. So in its stock form, you can use tubes like the 6922, which is a 6DJ8. You could also use the 6N1P, or then you could change over the jumper switch and use things like 12AU7s and other tubes like those. There's a full list in the manual of the Gemini. I might actually pop it on screen here so you can see the list of all the different tubes you can use with this one. And so that's all that that adjustment does. You look in the manual, you work out which tube you have, which jumper setting it needs, you pop the little jumper thing, this little tiny plastic thing, you pop this on the pins that you need it to be on, and then away you go listening to your tubes. From there, we've got another fairly simple adjustment, which is back over here near the RCA connections. And this is an input attenuator. And I love the fact that Andrew's included this. What this means is that you can change a couple of jumper switches, and I'm assuming what it's doing is probably just throwing a resistor or a series of resistors of some sort within the input circuit. And what that's gonna do is reduce the incoming signal by 15 decibels. So if you find that you can't get enough volume range out of the Gemini because you're using sensitive headphones, for instance, or you've got a particularly hot output on your DAC, let's say it's got a three volt output from the RCAs, 
you might find that you need to pull that back a bit. That's what those jumpers are going to do. The double bonus to that, though, is that I've found that by having that 15 dB cut applied permanently to the input, it actually allows me to play even more with the various tubiness. And what I mean by that is that I said before that the gain switch allows you to change how much influence of the tube you're getting or not getting. And so if you're somebody like me that finds that the high gain settings actually make it difficult to get much volume range, then you just apply this 15 dB cut and it gives you much more freedom to tweak it with that button and then see which sound you like more. And so for me, I've got my Gemini set up with the minus 15 dB permanently applied. You might choose to do it differently. I think it's just great that it's there though. And it does also apply, and I'll cover this off now, I guess. It does also apply to those of you that want to use the Gemini with IEMs. This is not an amplifier that I would recommend for IEM users. Even with the 15 dB cut and in low gain, you still don't get a huge range on the volume pot. Thankfully, it's an excellent quality pot, so channel imbalance is pretty much gone by about the kind of, where does it start? So you're starting at 7 o'clock. I reckon it's gone by 7.30 or 8 o'clock on the dial, and I was finding most IEMs, I'd be working at around about 9 o'clock on the dial. That's with the 15 dB cut and also in low gain. Having said that, depending on the tube, the gain settings, and the specific IEMs, you may hear a little bit of noise creeping in. Depending on the tubes I've used, sometimes I got a bit of hum, sometimes I got a bit of hiss. So I don't recommend this for a pure IEM user, but the good news is that depending on how you set it up and which tube you use, it is very much usable with most IEMs. So I'd say not optimal for IEMs, but usable for IEMs. For headphones, it works with everything. And now this brings us to the final jumper switch and probably the key jumper switch, and that's this one over here. So to the other side of the tube from the one I talked about first, and this is a bias setting switch. Now I'm going to talk about this with Andrew in the interview that I've got planned for him, so I'm not going to be able to go into it in detail just yet here. But what we've got in the bias switch here is it's essentially changing the current being delivered to the tube. What Andrew says in the manual, and indeed what I've heard with my ears, is that changing that bias setting from the high to the low bias, just like the gain switch, that's going to influence how much of the tube's influence once again gets into the sound. So in the low bias mode, you tend to get more tubiness. In the high bias mode, you tend to get less tubiness. And I'm saying tubiness here, what that means is whatever the particular tube you've got installed there, whatever its character is. All tubes sound a bit different, as I'm going to talk about a bit later. And so don't think of tubiness as having one particular connotation here. In some cases, it's a cleaner, crisper top end. In other cases, it's a thicker, warmer mid-range. So it's going to vary a lot. The point is, this jumper here is the same kind of effect as the gain switch at the front. And so ultimately, what you can get is four different levels of tube influence. And I'm going to pause this here. I'll run through exactly what I mean about that and what degrees of tube influence you get as you play with these. But so as not to overwhelm and overload you before we've even talked about how the Gemini sounds, I just want to pause here and say that those are the settings you've got. So you've got the gain setting, that's going to give you more or less influence of the tube. You've got the bias setting, that's also going to give you more or less influence of the tube. You've then got the attenuation setting, which is just purely a volume cut. And then you've got the heater setting, which is just purely to let you choose different tubes to go into the amplifier. And so let's pause the tweaks and the adjustments there, because there's going to be those of you that don't really care about that. You just want a nice sounding hybrid tube amp to plonk on your desk and enjoy. And so with that in mind, let's start talking about the sound quality of the stock Gemini with no tweaks applied. So in other words, as it arrives from Sparco's labs with the stock 6922 tube. And the first thing I'd say about the sound of the stock Gemini is it's both clean and smooth. The treble's very clear, very defined, but it's smooth. And so what I mean by that is there's no sense of roll-off or lost treble, but it's also more refined than many other solid-state or pure solid-state amps. I do feel like as I switch between the TT2 output, so by the way, I should backtrack a second, I was running the TT2 as my DAC for this one. And the reason for that is that I can also plug directly into the headphone outputs of the TT2 and hear pretty much exactly what's coming from the DAC. Now, the TT2 is a far more expensive device, so I'm not comparing them necessarily from a quality, transparency point of view, but just to get a sense of what flavour was the Gemini bringing to the sound. And what I noticed when I went from the TT2 output to the Gemini output was I feel like the bass just lost a little bit of depth from the Gemini in its stock form. So maybe not quite as tight, not quite as full bodied from the Gemini as to the TT2. But it is worth noting that that's with the tube that's in there, it's going to vary with different tubes. Some tubes are going to have more meat, more heft on the bottom end. So this doesn't mean that the Gemini is always only going to sound like what I'm describing, 
The point is, this is what it sounds like if you choose to buy it and do nothing further. If you don't roll tubes, if you don't play with the internal settings. What I did find with the Gemini was that overall, its tonality is pretty neutral. Pretty natural, actually, is probably a better term. It's not a neutral amp in the sense of being sterile or analytical, but it's not overly colouring the sound either. It's just giving that dash of kind of tuby smoothness, not tuby thickness or warmth or lushness, but smoothness. What that means is that your mid-range, your vocals are very smooth, very easy to enjoy, but there's no sense of lost clarity or texture or detail. The staging from the Gemini is also very good. I think width from this is excellent. It's not quite as deep as I expected. A lot of tube amps and even hybrid tube amps often throw quite a deep stage. I didn't find that from the Gemini, at least not with the stock tube. But at the same time, it doesn't feel like a wall of sound. It's not up in your face. But I was aware that most of the staging size is in the width with a little bit of depth there. And so all in all, the Gemini in its stock form, I think is a fantastic sounding hybrid amp. It's always a bit tricky with hybrid amps because we're talking about an amplifier that is heavily influenced by whatever tube you put in there. So in this case, I've currently got a 6DJ8 tube. This is an old NOS Bugle Boy tube. And this sounds completely different from the stock 6922 that was in there, which by the way looks exactly the same except for the printing on the side. And so the key thing here is the stock form sounds good, but recognize that everything I just described, you can change with the right choice of tube. The good news is the quality is never going to drop off drastically, but it can actually increase a little bit. And of course, the tonality, the general character, the staging, all of that can change with the right choice of tube, should you want to. And this brings me back to what I said before. If you want to buy this, never think about tweaking anything to do with it and just enjoy it. It sounds lovely. It's natural. It's smooth. It's got texture, but it's not dry or analytical. You're probably trading off a little bit of bass punch and depth in order to get that nice smooth sound but it doesn't feel like you're missing anything unless you start doing comparisons. It's a really solid, natural sounding and highly enjoyable tube amp. And so with that in mind and recognizing that it's very difficult when we're comparing tube amps because the tubes in the amp are kind of the sound of the amp, but recognizing that, I did want to do a couple of really quick comparisons for you just to put into context where I think the Gemini sits in the scheme of other amps. I was chatting to somebody in the comment section when I first mentioned that this was coming in for review, and they said that they felt like the Gemini was right up there with something like the Linear Tube Audio MZ3. That shocked me because the MZ3 is a $3,700 US dollar amplifier. It's also a pure tube amp, not a hybrid amp. And so one of the tests that I did was to actually see, does the Gemini stack up to that level of competition? One of the tracks I used for this test was The Universe Is You by Sophie Ellis Baxter. This is an electronic track with a strong female vocal. It's a very good track in terms of just hearing a bit of everything that the amplifier can do. I'm not saying it's the ideal test track, but when it came on, it gave me a really good sense of the full range capabilities of the Gemini and the MZ3. Starting off on the Gemini with the Mesa Elites as my headphone, and the sound was wonderful. It was clean, it was punchy, the separation of individual sounds, and there's quite a lot going on in this song, all of that was really well separated by the Gemini. There was nothing to complain about at all. But then when I moved over to the MZ3, and remembering it's about nearly four times the price, going to the MZ3, everything separated so much more. It was very clear to me why you would spend the extra on the MZ3, because there was a greater sense of space. The vocal was more separated from everything, more focused in terms of its imaging capabilities or qualities. And I also felt like the bass was a bit tighter and punchier from the MZ3. And keep in mind, once again, we are talking about tube amps, therefore the tube influences the sound. I'm using the stock tubes in the MZ3, the stock tubes in the Gemini, and therefore tweaking both could completely change those results. Which is not to say you should throw all this out and ignore what I'm saying. The point is, you can upgrade the Gemini if you want to. You can also upgrade the MZ3 if you want to, of course, as well. But the key thing that I took away from this test was that the Gemini is excellent, but it's not at the level of the MZ3. It's doing some things differently. Again, the other thing to keep in mind is that I hadn't played with any of the tweaks. I hadn't added more or less of the tubiness by going with the gain switch or the internal bias jumper. There were lots of things I could have done that might have brought it closer to the MZ3. But for me, it sits in its stock form at about the right level for what you're paying. I'm comfortable that it sounds like a 1000 odd US dollar amplifier. And while we're talking about performance and comparisons, I did two other quick comparisons. One of them was super fast, so I'm going to go through it really, really quickly. And that is that I figured a number of you that have spotted the X-Duo TA20 Plus sitting behind me here 
I figured that some of you would want to know how this as a hybrid amp compares to that as a hybrid amp, a hybrid tube amp I mean. And the answer is that the TA20 Plus sounds really, really good for what you're paying for it. The TA20 Plus from memory is about $500, US the Gemini as I said is nearly $1,000, US and I actually felt like the TA20 Plus was getting mighty close to what the Gemini can do. Having said that, you don't get any of the tweakability. I don't believe that the TA20 Plus is a preamp. I haven't played with its output yet, but I think it's more of a pass-through than a preamp output. So they're very different designs. There's a lot more versatility and functionality from the Gemini in terms of tube rolling. And so I'm comfortable that you would pay more for the Gemini to get the functionality that it offers. But it also goes to show that it's going to be worth tuning in for the TA20 Plus review. I'll do a full comparison between these two for that review. But for now, what I'm going to say is that I'm still comfortable that the Gemini is worth the money you pay for it, but there's also some strong competition just kind of hanging around in the wings. The other comparison that I wanted to make here was for another amplifier at about the $1,000 mark. If you're going to spend 1000 bucks on a headphone amp and preamp, what else could you get and should you get something different? And so I looked at the Burson Soloist 3XP. That's a solid state and a pure solid state amp. It's got a little bit of tweakability because you can roll the op amps. So for instance, you could take out the Burson B6 Vivids and place in Sparco's own SS3602, I think it's a 3602, whatever their sort of standard consumer grade op amp is. So it's got some tweakability just like the Gemini does, but in this case, it's solid state tweakability instead of tube tweakability. Listening to Pretzel Logic by Steely Dan and comparing once again using them as elites. And what I heard was that the solid state amplifier being the 3XP, the Solos 3XP, that delivered a stronger and more focused image. The separation of the vocals in this track were just a bit cleaner and more obvious from the Solos 3XP, but on the flip side, it wasn't quite as smooth. And so on some setups, some headphones, or if it's a preamp, some speakers, you may find it more fatiguing. I definitely think that the Solos 3XP is technically the stronger amplifier. I think it's drawing out a little bit more resolution. As I said, it's giving you that stronger sense of separation and imaging. But if you said to me which one's more fun to listen to, it's kind of a toss of a coin, and it's going to depend on which headphones, which speakers are connected to it. As I said before, the 3XP does give you some tweakability through the op-amp rolling, but it's nowhere near as tweakable as the Gemini. And to put that comment into perspective, when I took the 6DJ8, the Bugle Boy that I've got sitting in here now, and replaced the stock tube with this higher quality 6DJ8, that suddenly brought things a lot closer. Now all of a sudden, the Gemini was much, much closer in terms of imaging and separation to the Solos 3XP, but it was also still smoother to listen to. And so ultimately what I'm saying here is that both of them are great amps. It's really going to come down to whether you want that pure solid state experience of maximum resolution and detail and cleanliness, or whether you like the tube rolling opportunities and that slightly smoother, slightly kind of more euphonic sound that tubes can bring. And so the takeaway from this, as I've already said, is that the Gemini, in my opinion, is worth the money. I think for a hybrid tube amp, it performs about where I'd expect it to. And then the value that you're getting from it is not so much in pure audio performance from a technical perspective, although it does perform very well technically, but the value that you're getting from it is all the adjustments you can make. The ability to decide that I want a slightly cooler amp today, pop in a different tube, or I want something that's really rich and thick to go with a pair of bright headphones, pop in a different tube, adjust the jumper settings or adjust the gain switch and away you go. That's the value of the Gemini. That's what sets it apart. And so with all that in mind, let's quickly run through what I said before about the tweakability of this one. Let me dive just a little bit deeper and explain to you how these tweaks work, which ones have more or less influence on the sound. As I said earlier, both the gain switch and this bias jumper on the inside, both of them change how much influence the tube has over the output sound. So in other words, if you want maximum solid stateness out of this amp, and by the way, it does get quite solid state sounding if you want it to, then you can put the bias setting in high bias, which is going to minimize the tube sound, and then you can put the gain switch in high gain, and what you're going to end up with is a very solid state version of the Gemini. That's great too, because it's using the Spyco's Labs top end pro op amps, which are amazing, and then with a the flick of a switch and or the adjustment of a jumper setting, you can also then turn this the other direction and go full tube mode. I say full tube mode, it is still going to go via the solid state output stage, 
but the point is it's going to give you maximum tube sound without having a pure tube amp with some of the trade-offs that come with that, like higher output impedance, maybe a bit less power, all those sorts of things. And so to clarify how this works, as I said before, low gain mode is going to give you more tube influence, high gain mode is going to give you less tube influence. And then for the bias setting, the low bias is going to give you more tube influence. The high bias is going to give you less tube influence. So it's kind of the opposite of the word. High each time means less tube. Low each time means more tube. And the key thing that I took away from my testing of these different settings is that the two different settings have slightly different amounts of influence. So in other words, the high gain and low gain setting is a little bit less influential on the amount of tube sound you get than the bias setting on the inside. And so to clarify that, if you put the bias switch in the low bias setting, you're going to get more tubiness than if you put the gain switch in the low gain setting. And what that means is that you can kind of step through four different scales of tube influence using the Gemini. As I said before, if you go high gain, high bias, you're going to get the absolute minimum amount of tube. So let's say arbitrarily you're getting 20% worth of tube in that high gain, high bias setting. If you then change it to the high bias but go to low gain, now what you might be getting is, say, 40% tube. If you then change that around so that the bias gives you maximum tube and the gain gives you the minimum amount, now what you're going to be getting is, let's say, 50% tube. And then finally, if you put both of them on maximum, now you might be jumping up to, say, 70% tube. Now those are just arbitrary numbers, but the point is you've got different levels, different degrees of that tube influence. And because the gain switch and the bias switch have slightly different amounts of influence over that, you can actually step through four different levels. And that's proved to be lots and lots of fun going through my tube rolling with the Gemini. And so what I'm going to do is actually a separate short video for those of you that are interested in the tube rolling side of the Gemini. You can check out the separate video where I go through my favorite tubes and which settings I felt brought the best out of those tubes in the Gemini circuit. But I think for now, this video has probably gone on long enough. So let's bring it to a close here by saying that I think the Gemini is an absolute dream headphone amplifier, particularly for somebody that wants to tube roll. I think if you just want to buy a headphone amp and never ever think twice about it, you just want to plug it in, hook up your headphones and let it play, then maybe you can spend your money better on something like a TA20+. Plus. As I said, we'll see when I get to the review of that one and I do a thorough comparison with the Gemini. Because I think the real value of the Sparkos Labs Gemini is in its ability to tube roll and tweak the amount of tube influence you get. And so I'd say if you're looking for a high-end hybrid tube amp that's just a plug-and-play, set-and-forget type thing, then make sure you hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell for the upcoming review of the TA20+. Plus. Or if you happen to just like what Andrew and the team at Sparkos are doing and you just want to jump straight in, you can absolutely do that, resting assured that this is a wonderful, wonderful amp all on its own. But then the other side of the equation is that if you are someone that likes the idea of tube rolling, the Gemini is an absolute wonder. The ability to tweak it so easily and across so many levels of influence are absolutely fantastic. And the other massive benefit that I haven't mentioned yet is the fact that you can just use one tube at a time. You can only use one tube at a time. And the reason that's a huge benefit is you don't have to buy matched pairs. You don't have to worry about finding the matched pairs that someone's charging five times the price for because they're matched and they're a little bit rare. Instead, you can often get bargains because someone that's gone out and bought a huge batch of unique and vintage NOS tubes and they've done lots of matching and they've left with a couple of stragglers, you can buy those stragglers often at a reduced rate and get the most out of them in the Gemini here. So I love the fact that it's a single tube amp that lets you roll through lots of tubes, it gives you lots of different options of the models of tubes you use, and the great news is it sounds fantastic with everything I've rolled through it. Occasionally, I've had to adjust the settings a bit to get the most out of that particular tube for my particular tastes. But the simple fact that you can do that adjustment, that's fantastic. And so I'm going to leave things here with a strong recommendation of the Sparko Labs Gemini for those that want to tweak with tubes. I'm also going to recommend it for those that just want to set and forget headphone amp. But it's a recommendation on the understanding that there may be better stuff out there we're going to find out soon. And then the final thing for me to say is that if you're into tube rolling, if you love the idea of this, you want to know more about the different tubes that I've used, then make sure you watch out for the upcoming tube rolling video. I'll release that one tomorrow. Or if this one's already out, there'll be a link in the description of the video here. But then beyond that, I'll leave it to the music. So happy listening, and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound. Passion for Sound.